okay then uh, so i hope i'm audible uh, and uh, welcome back uh, to the sixth week of the uh, problem solving session of the introduction uh, of of the course fluid mechanics and applications and in this week we will look into the one of the very important concepts in the domain of fluid mechanics that is the law of conservation of linear momentum or the mo momentum equations so as a fundamental component of the f of the fluid dynamics like uh, in fluid dynamics where we are considering the forces that act on the fluid uh, fluid uh, the conservation of linear momentum acts uh, in what to say a fundamental part in defining these forces as we know that the rate of change of linear momentum is equal to the net force applied from the newton second law similarly we also know that the rate of change of angular momentum in a body is equal to net is equal to the net torque applied in a body so we will see uh, both of these theorems and how these theorems uh, come into play while dealing with uh, different fluid mechanics problems so uh, let's start from the basics let's start from the very derivation of the linear momentum equation so uh, there are various ways by which uh, the linear momentum equation can be derived but i tend to follow the uh, i'm sorry Okay, I'm sorry. I tend to follow the approach from RTT, like since this is a very simple, uh, exquisite method or mathematical method from which we can directly derive the linear momentum equation by just changing this, uh, just playing with this uh, uh, n, this small n term. So I'll just do that. So in the case of uh, linear momentum. Our capital N, the ex N's extensive property that has to be conserved is mv, right? Mass into velocity, where v is the vector in this case, and as we know, n can be a scalar as well as a vector, right? So, <coughs> for our case, we choose uh, capital N is equal to mv, that's, that, that will simply give us small n, that will simply give us small n is equal to v right then we substitute uh, this in the uh, 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 de de definition of uh, rtt so we will get dmv by dt for the system is equal to rho by dot t of the volume integral of the uh, product rho v dv plus the surface integral of the product rho v dr n cap da right so here are some things are important to be noted first of all the, the thing is that here this term v v cap that we are sorry v cap the v vector that we are denoting here it is the absolute velocity with respect to the chosen frame of reference okay I'm sorry, let me like write it a bit clearly. So, absolute velocity with respect to a chosen frame of reference. Okay. Uh, again, this frame of reference must be inertial. So, Because if the frame of reference is non-inertial, the governing equation should, would be modified accordingly. So, for our context, we will choose our frame of references to be inertial, and this is basically non-accelerating frame of references. And uh, with respect to that, <coughs> with respect to our chosen frame of reference, this vector v denotes the absolute uh, magnitude of the velocity. Okay, and again, uh, similar to the previous case, uh, I'll just wait for one minute. <coughs> so, <coughs> so, uh, uh, 
yes uh, okay ha huh. so uh, similar to the uh, previous case for the mass conservation this vr n cap or in specifically vr denotes the relative velocity of the fluid with respect to the control volume that we have chosen right so if the control volume is moving we will, we have to accordingly change the magnitude of the velocity magnitude as well as direction it needed of the velocity that uh, that is being written here okay that is being considered here in this product okay so this is what we need to consider and uh, contrary to the mass conservation that we were previously discussing the control system term is not equal to zero and indeed is equal to the net force that acts on the control system or the control volume right because for the limit t tends to zero the force that acts on the summation of all force that acts on the control surface would be equal to the force that acts on the control volume okay so this is a very important assumption that we have considered so uh, yeah so this is uh, the uh, so basically this is our equation of concern for our discussion for to for today's discussion that is the uh, conservation of linear momentum uh, in the case of fluid flow okay so uh, again uh, this equation again i guess this was discussed by professor gupta so in his lecture so this again implies the same thing where f denotes the net force that acts on the control volume a uh, con uh, control volume a uh, control volume control system because for limit t tends to zero uh, the, it, this is equal to the net force that acts on the control volume right uh, and again uh, this basically this assumption that i mentioned here. Just for you to know that, sorry, 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 you are not confused. <coughs> and here, if P denotes the momentum of the body, or basically in this case linear momentum, so F would be equal to dou P by dou T plus summation of all momentum fluxes through all momentum fluxes through all the ports in, in the chosen control volume, right? So we just briefly go through the momentum theorem. So it basically tells that. <coughs> the net external force acting on the control volume is equal to the rate of change of momentum contained in the control volume plus the net efflux of the momentum across the control surface that is again valid for inertial frame inertial frame of references okay so uh, this force right this force that we are discussing that may act that are acting on the uh, control volume so what are these type of forces, right? Uh, I guess uh, you, you, you would have uh, taken any control, uh, sorry, any fluid mechanics course or you have just gone through your lectures as discussed by Professor Gupta. Mm -hmm. The types of forces that basically act on a control volume, in the, especially in the case of a fluid flow, can be dissociated into two, two parts, okay? First is the surface forces. Second is the body forces, okay? So as the name that as the name directly implies, surface forces implies the forces that acts along the surface of the body. Okay, and uh, similarly, the body forces denote <coughs> the forces that act throughout the body of the <coughs> throughout the body, or I must say, throughout the volume of the control volume that we have chosen, right? So <coughs> this is the uh, uh, so again yes. So these type of surface forces, like the surface forces, constitutes of the, especially uh, for a case of fluid flow, it constitutes the uh, stress, stress, stress terms, forces, forces to stresses, shear stress, normal stress, pressure. You will again see pressure is a uh, kind uh, special case of stress where in the in which the pressure is included as a normal stress that acts on the body, right? And then can be there can be surface tension. Right. But uh, for most of the problems that we will, will that we will be dealing with, uh, mainly constitutes of the forces due to stresses and pressure. Okay. So this is what uh, the external uh, forces due to surface forces constitutes. Similar to that. Uh, for body forces, these are the forces that uh, include the forces due to gravity and electromagnetism. And, and again, for our general context or the general uh, part where of the core uh, course that we will be discussing, we will be dealing with only 
uh, gravity okay the gravitational force because this is the force like that exists like as long as we are on earth uh, and we are dealing with uh, fluid flow problems gravity cannot be ignored right uh, it can be ignored in that case the where the net contribution due to the gravitational forces can be negligibly small compared to the other types of forces that acts in the uh, control volume but this like cannot be ideally zero right it can be equivalent to zero but cannot be ideally zero right so this is a very important uh, fact to know so that's why uh, for most of our problems day to day life problems we will, the only body for the only body force that we uh, consider is actually the gravitational force okay for special cases there will be electromagnetic forces so this that should be considered as a uh, body force for special cases obviously sorry uh, body force for special cases uh, just, uh, for special cases say for example in the case where uh, flow is driven due to the electric potential difference between the confinement where the between which the fluid uh, is contained right say there is a confinement of this form say. and uh, it, it, it contains fluid uh, within it so if yes if you say that uh, the one of the plates is positively charged right? positively charged and one of the plates is negatively charged and you can say that okay, let me use another color so you can say that the fluid constitutes of both negative and positive charges so So since the entire solution, this will be a uh, dielectric solution, I must say. So the, if the entire solution is uh, composed of uh, positive and negative ions, so the existence of a potential difference between the plates would result in a mass movement of these uh, ions, which would in turn uh, lead to the net uh, need to uh, the mass movement of the fluid right and it is this movement of these charges that would uh, drive the force in the case of such uh, geometry or in, in this special case so in these cases the electromagnetic force would act as a body force and that cannot be neglected so it would be a very important component of the momentum equation so in that case, uh, the body force would be can exclusively considered can be exclusively considered as a uh, uh, force uh, as a electromagnetic force. And if you if we, if we assume that again if we assume that the dimension of the confinement is very small, say in the order of millimeter, right, order of millimeters. So in that case, in that scenarios, the uh, the body force due to or the net. Uh, body force that x in this confinement in the fluid in this co content in this confinement would be negligibly small or insignificant in the driving of the fluid in this confinement okay so the main factor that drives the flow would be the driving factor would be the electrostatic potential So these are some of the examples that in where uh, different kinds of body uh, forces become significant. But since these kind of uh, okay, and these are like especially if you are dealing with order millimeter, so these are called micro channels. Okay. I'm not saying that these are not important. These are actually a very uh, popular or extensively researched topic in uh, fluid mechanics and has a very important implication in various examples say in the case of uh, 
ब्लड फ्लो और इलेक्ट्रोफोरेसिस इन दिस काइंड ऑफ से एप्लीकेशंस वी नो द फंक्शनिंग ऑफ सच माइक्रो चैनल्स दिस कम्स क्वाइट हैंडी और क्वाइट यूजफुल बट फॉर डे टू डे पर्पजेज से फ्लो थ्रू पाइप्स फ्लो थ्रू चैनल्स इन दोज केसेस दिस इलेक्ट्रोमैगनेटिक फोर्सेज द द नॉट कम इन टू पिक्चर राइट द सो द मेजर बॉडी फोर्स दैट कम्स इन टू पिक्चर इज द फोर्स डी टू ग्रेविटी सो दैट्स वाई फॉर मोस्ट ऑफ आर केसेस वी विल कंसिडर ग्रेविटी एज वर बॉडी फोर्स राइट सो ओके सो अगेन दीज आर सम ऑफ द कंसिडरेशंस आई मस्ट से दैट नीड्स दैट नीड टू बी थॉट ऑफ बिफोर चूजिंग ए कंट्रोल वॉल्यूम ओके सो आई विल जस्ट रीड रीड थ्रू इट because a choice of a proper control volume i guess comes to uh, experience like again and again if you try to apply the uh, rtt for the control volume obviously and then imply apply the mass conservation or momentum conservation so for mass conservation it becomes quite simple but still uh, momentum conservation again it uh, for momentum conservation it's a bit again a bit more complicated because in mass conservation we are not concerned with the forces but uh, choice of choice of uh, different control volumes like the choice of control volumes can lead to uh, ex- uh, ex- existence or emergence of different types of new forces in the system or in the control volume that would again complicate the problem so choice of a control volume is again also very key factor in uh, the in the oil energy approach so of solving fluid mechanics problems so that's why uh, uh, professor gupta has mentioned uh, this three uh what to say key points for considering before choosing a control volume for our uh, fluid flow problems okay so i will just uh, read through it because <coughs> the statements are quite self explanatory so let me just go read read, read past it okay so uh the fluid velocities at the entrances and the and exits are normal to the control surface there so the mass flow rates rho v dot a at the ports are evaluated simply as rho v a yeah because since if they are dot product uh, so if they are like the angle between the area vector and the velocity vector is zero so rho v dot a will basically give us rho v a so it becomes quite simple okay this is one uh, again important factor and again uh, this is also important and actually this should be as few as so as few as external surface forces act on the control surface constituted by the cv so the choice of cv or the control volume should be such that uh, there must be least uh, what to say least amount of or least areas where or sections of the control surface uh, on which the con- uh, surface forces may act okay say the shear stresses or pressure so we would like to choose a control volume which would uh, which would help us to ignore the interactions uh, because of the se- uh, interactions on the op- on the fluid because of the shear stresses or any kind of stresses say pressure shear stresses or pressure that may act on the fluid if we have chosen some certain kind of control volumes okay so, so i will uh, take one example i guess one of the example in, in the following uh, slides or pages uh, where you can see the choice of control volume results in the emergence of shear stresses like a different choice of control volume results in the cho- uh, emergence of shear stresses that again complicates the problem so uh, this is a uh, one of the important key factor so the choice of control volumes will be such that there must be Uh, as few as surface forces as as few as external surface forces that acts on the s- control surface okay uh, i hope this is clear so uh, again this is self explanatory but i hope this is clear again finally <coughs> the control surface should as far as possible not to be chosen with the fluid adjacent to it otherwise the presence of shear stresses on such surfaces may introduce in some amount of problems again it is quite similar to the first point so it tells that uh, that the con- the control surface that we are choosing should be uh, 
as far as the fluid adjacent to it so the control surface like uh, should be such that uh, uh, the control surface should be such that say we are in such that we are ignoring the uh, walls uh, walls and the fluid like the fluid uh, the fluid in, uh, interacting with the walls such that the mm -hmm. if we choose such control volumes we can ignore the shear stresses they may that may act uh, in the that may act on the fluid because of the its interaction with the walls okay so let me just draw it against uh, it will be more clear so if we have uh, say uh, flow or say if we just have flow or a wall okay for I am not saying explicitly type it because it's again a uh, very well established uh, fluid flow problem but <coughs> just say there is a flow over a wall or a flat surface okay flat surface and there is a fluid flow past it okay so there is a fluid flow past it so, so according to this statement an ideal choice of control surface would be such that we are including the walls the walls uh, uh, above is the free flows as well in the control volume okay so what it does is uh, it essentially eliminates the consideration of the shear forces the shear stresses that acts uh, that would have acted if we would have, if we would have, we would have chosen uh, a control volume in, in this manner okay so in, in these cases like uh, in, uh, in this scenario now we can just uh, ignore because uh, ignore the calculation or evaluation of the uh, shear stresses in this case so uh, we would see an example when uh, how this uh, uh, the consideration of shear stresses is uh, eliminated by the choice of such control volumes but uh, just, just 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 as a pre remind a pre reminder that uh, ideally a choice of control volume would be such that we are including the walls also above which or along which the fluid flows so that we can we can ignore the <coughs> existence of the shear forces that would have acted on the fluid if we would have ignored or the if we would have ignored the walls okay so Quite uh, to put it simply, like if we would have if we would have chosen a control surface in the case of the red, uh, red dotted line, so the red control volume shear forces. You all right, right. Because the uh, because the control volume is itself uh, de designed in a way or chosen in a way that a shear force is acting in the control volume, right? But if we if we, if we choose the green CV, evaluation, sorry, evaluation of the shear forces can be neglected. Uh, uh, this will uh, become like more clear uh, once we take an example flow over a vein so I guess that is why example that we consider so that would uh, make the picture really clear so yeah Okay, so uh, this is one of the examples. So it's uh, dealing with the flow through a nozzle, or specifically in this case, a fireman's nozzle. So I guess specifically because of the shape, but ideally, the nozzle is just uh, this portion of this entire hose. This additional, what to say, accessory that is being added on the pipe. So in that case, so this converging part of this uh, hose or pipe was actually the nozzle, but 
let's just say for this case uh, for this example we are considering the this whole uh, geometry as the nozzle this whole one so uh, <coughs> again it is told that there is a diameter reduction of from 50 millimeter to 25 millimeter so here the idea says that the diameter here is 50 millimeter and the diameter here is 25 millimeter okay so the pressure at the point one I guess it is gauge pressure. So the gauge, the gauge pressure at point one is uh, 300 kilopascal, and at point two, since uh, it is not mentioned, I guess it is. Uh, we can ideally take it as pre-atmospheric, right? Atmospheric pressure. So let me just write it. Okay. Again, uh, velocity at the inlet. They mentioned it as uh, 6.3 meter per second. And fx here denotes the direction of the force along the x direction. Okay, so uh, along the the or the x component of force that x on the uh, on this control volume. Okay, on this control volume. So, uh, I'm sorry. So, for uh, let let uh, let's look into it. So for uh, steady flows, uh, the dou by dou t term can be uh, ideally neglected so for steady force the net force that x on the control volume the, that are our chosen control volume that is this green this green box drawn by the dotted lines would be the summation of the net efflux the ordinate momentum efflux through all the force that we have chosen in our control volume right so again in, in this case it would be again fx would be equal to summation of in all ports rho v dot a vx because on is only uh, uh, we are considering velocity uh, the force only in the x direction okay. so we consider the x component of velocity so the fx the net forces that x on the control volume what are they they can the one one force is this uh, reaction force that has been uh, that is due to the what to say this that is because of this uh, hose or nozzle being connected to the uh, to a sturdy surface so there will be reaction force so fx we need to consider and the one uh, then again there is a force uh, of uh, due to pressure the incoming force due to pressure because of the incoming fluid in the uh, inlet okay so uh, this why we get fx this fx would be equal to p1 g a1 so p1 g basically denotes the gauge pressure or gauge pressure a1 is the <coughs> area at the inlet so this is the area p1 g a1 plus fx okay the reaction force and that would be equal to this term the summation of the net momentum efflux through all the ports so at the exit uh, let me just zoom out a bit so that it is visible so at the exit again so the net momentum in terms of the rho v a then the net mass flow rate because now uh, since the force uh, uh, from mass conservation we seen the force steady so for mass conservation we would have steady and incompressible so for the mass conservation we would have rho a v 1 would be equal to rho a v 2 so we can just take that so at the station 2 or at the exit we have rho v a 2 v2 because v2 is the velocity at station 2 so rho a to a rho v a to v2 minus rho v a1 v1 which is the, the inlet okay so the inlet is output so again as we know from mass conservation rho v rho a v1 would be equal to rho a v2 so we take that as m dot or the net mass flow rate so fx would be what can be evaluated as m dot v2 minus v1 minus p1 g a1 okay uh, why P2, uh, P2 uh, pressure at point 2 is not present because since it is we are considering gauge pressure so P2 would be 0 P2G or uh, let me just write it so P2G is equal to 0 okay. gauge pressure is 0 that's why it is not considered here. so net uh, force that is required to hold this force because this is attached so that this attachment is being done so that this force does not mm move away it does not move away because of the pressure of the fluid that is ent entering at its inlet right 
So to prevent that this uh, this uh, attachment has been done. So we need to find that f x. So the f x would be equal to m dot v two minus v one minus p one g a one. Okay. So uh, this again uh, uh, to evaluate uh, since we, here we know p one g p one g we know a one is given v one is given. So we need to find v two. So again this uh, this next step is again a very crude uh, crude. Uh, approximation so if we assume the point it's a point at the center point at the center of the nozzle okay the center of the nozzle at the inlet again similar similarly you can consider a, a point at the center at the outlet so uh, considering that uh, considering that the shear forces or the shear stresses because of the fluid is negligibly small i am not saying current is zero but negligibly small as we have seen uh, like in the previous sessions that how the ap application of uh, the bernoulli's equation can be extended so one of the few uh, few assumptions that we can make to simplify this problem to simplify the approach to obtain the velocity at the uh, what to say exit so uh, we can uh, apply bernoulli's equation so we assuming that uh <coughs> the, the okay let me go back so assuming that the point that we have selected let me zoom in a bit uh that the point that we have selected is far away from the boundaries far away from the boundaries of the pipe or the nozzle so we can assume that at those point or at least at that point uh the influence of the shear stresses because of the walls of the uh, pipe would be negligibly small so for this first assumption that the shear stresses on the fluid because of the walls of the pipe are negligibly small okay so and the flow is steady so if we assume <coughs> then again that point 1 and point 2 to be at a streamline so uh, <coughs> we can apply the bernoulli's equation now so applying bernoulli's equation sorry z1 and z2 will go out because they are the same elevation Again, P two G will go out because it is the gauge pressure. So, we finally have uh, our fin the final equation from the equation that we that we would have is V one square by two G plus P one G by rho G is equal to V two square by two G. So, solving this equation because now we know we know V one we know sorry we know V one we know P one G. So, all terms are known. Then we can just finally evaluate V two. So, from that we get V two is equal to twenty five point three meter per second. Okay. So. Uh, if if v2 is known we can just finally uh, substitute the value of v2 in this equation let me just write it v2 in this equation so we would get uh, fx would be equal to minus 353.8 newton so the minus sign again gives a very uh, uh what to say important conclusion so here in this case we have chosen that the reaction force that would act is along the say in the positive x direction okay we have by our default uh, choice uh, we have chosen that uh, fx would act in the positive x direction but even <coughs> even after continuing uh, continuing our, all our uh, calculations we finally find that the net force is minus 33.8 in the negative x direction so that so this ideally gives us a very uh, good sense of direction of the net force that would act on the attachment this uh, at this point so it ideally gives us an idea that since the flow it is incoming in the inlet at a high pressure uh, so definitely it tells that the force here would be much higher than here because the flow, flow is being pumped out from the exit right so we need to ideally uh, uh, exert a force in this direction so that we could hold this uh, pipe or this arrangement in its position right so this is very so the sign of the net force even like even if you started with the fx to be in the positive x direction so the net co the solution or the final answer tells us that the fx should ideally act along this direction so that it could prevent the hose from moving right moving forward so so that it could hold it in the in, in its position 
so okay so this is done so now uh, we look another uh, we look into another problem so this is force on a pin okay so this uh, example will uh, give us an idea like how to uh, how the choice of control volume uh, simplifies our problem okay so this red this red part this one this one is the vein so which is again being attached to a uh, how to say sturdy surface uh, so uh, here the fluid uh, is incoming as a jet it comes as a liquid jet and strikes on the vein and where the liquid again after striking moves out through this exit okay which is denoted by exit one and two okay so it is told that the diameter of the jet of the incoming jet is two centimeter and the velocity with which the jet enters the control surface or the absolute velocity of the jet is 10 meter per second and this would be again you can take this as v y because the vein is stationary okay so v r will be equal to v so that's quite simple so now uh sorry so what we now do is we evaluate the net uh, momentum fluxes at the inlet and the outlet okay so and this angle of the vein the angle of inclination of the vein is given to be 60 degree okay so uh, <coughs> for initial choice for as an initial choice we choose this black dotted lines as our control volume okay that comprises of the whole of the vein and the incoming uh, inlet uh, and the incoming jet or the inlet of the jet okay it is a bit far from the uh, vein itself so this is the control volume that we have chosen for our case this is the control volume So at the inlet, we would have uh, the velocity, uh, the momentum flux as minus rho v a in the inlet into v. So v is again the absolute velocity. So v would be equal to v would be 10 meter per second. Okay. So y minus again because the velocity vector is in the direction opposite to the area vector. So it will be uh, we will have a minus sign. So it is minus rho v a into v. Okay. So uh, uh, again. Uh, for the outlet we have and this v would be positive y because uh, we have chosen it uh, to be in the positive x direction so ideally i guess we should also draw a, a coordinate a, a axis uh, with respect to which we are doing our calculations so this is the coordinate axis so this v is positive y because we have chosen v uh, to be in the positive x direction okay? so this v would be positive so this is positive right so and again at the outlet we have the net momentum plus rho v a this will be positive because the uh, velocity vector and the area vector are in the same direction that is the velocity is normal to the exit uh, area to exit so we have the area vector and our velocity vector in the same direction so uh, this term is positive again uh, the velocity component along uh, in the uh, positive x uh, the positive y direction would be v cos theta so uh, this is the sorry sorry velocity component along the x direction i'm sorry i'm sorry because we are considering the x momentum flux so we need to consider the uh, net flux along the x direction so the velocity component along the x, x direction would be v cos theta so that's why uh, the outlet one in this the net uh, momentum flux along x direction would be rho v square a cost 60 degree okay similarly at the uh, outlet two we would have rho v a2 this will be positive why because the area vector and the momentum uh, velocity vector are in the same direction so this is positive but again this is negative why because uh, with, with respect to our chosen frame of reference this v cos 60 degree is in along the minus x direction so we would have minus sign here so it is minus v cos 60 degree okay so so again uh, so net uh, force along the x direction would be given by fx equal to minus rho v square a why because it's quite simple you clearly see that uh, this uh, this term 
and this term cancel out each other because uh, because the density remain constant v is uh, 10 meter per second area is constant so the v cos 60 degree and minus cos 60 degree cancel out each other so these two terms will cancel out so only term that would remain uh, would be the uh, of, uh, net momentum flux at the inlet so fx would be given as minus rho v square a okay and again this is uh, this uh, we are not considering pressure in this case so fx would be equal to minus rho v square a and considering the flow to be steady so there will be no uh, time derivative term in this case so fx would be equal to only minus rho v square a so that would give us minus 31.4 newton fx right Again, this ideally tells us that the net force that which, that will be needed to hold this vein along in this in this direction will be along the negative x direction, right? And <coughs> or again, uh, one another way to interpret uh, this uh, this sign uh, would be that this f x ideally denotes the net force that acts on the fluid because of the vein okay so it is in the uh, that, that tells us that the net force that acts on the vein because it basically is a reaction force right so the net force that acts on the vein on the fluid because of the vein is minus 31.4 newton that is along the negative x direction so this vein will exert a force along the minus negative x direction on this control volume okay so that compresses the fluid obviously and again so let me zoom out a bit more so that we can see the y components as well so along the y direction again so at the inlet because there is only uh, flow is only along the x direction so we need not to evaluate the uh, momentum process at the inlet so but at the two outlets since we have some uh, uh, velocity components along the y direction so we need to calculate evaluate the momentum process at both the inlets okay so at outlet one so so at both the outlets i'm sorry so at outlet one the net momentum flux would be rho v a again this will be positive right I, i'm just repeating it for this problem because from next time from next problems i guess it will be self-explanatory so i will not go on to each and every term again 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 okay so for the y momentum fluxes uh, uh, at the uh, outlet one rho v a one would be positive why because the velocity and the area vector are along the same direction so rho this term is positive again v sin 60 degree this is positive because the velocity component uh, is in the positive y direction right in the, that's in the positive y axis so that's why we have at the outlet one we have the momentum flux is equal to rho v square a sin 60 degree okay and in outlet two we have the same momentum flux will be positive uh, this this term will be positive why because the area vector and the velocity vector are along the same direction so this term will be positive but again uh, we can see that the velocity component along the y direction is along the negative y axis so that's why there will be a minus sign here so it will be minus v sin 60 degree so the net momentum flux at outlet 2 would be rho minus rho v square a sin 60 degree and if we again add those two uh, as uh, as at, at both of them we will get the net force along the y direction would be zero okay so uh I uh, just uh, re request to excuse uh, me for <coughs> two minutes so kindly just uh, wait for two minutes so I'll be back soon so
so uh, I'm sorry that uh, forgive me for this uh, bit delay delay of two two minutes so I'm sorry for that so let's continue so uh, next okay I'm sorry I'm, I just forgot one important part okay. yes in this example say the uh, this example like in this example if you look into it so here what we are actually evaluating is the net force that acts on the control volume okay the control volume that we have chosen the net force that acts on the control volume okay uh, but uh, in this control volume like even if uh, we have not uh, considered the shear stresses that x that 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 x on the fluid because of its flow uh, along the vein even if we have not considered it is quite uh, what to say quite cleverly uh, incorporated because incorporated in the solution because of the choice of the control volume okay since uh, we have chosen a control volume in such a manner that is as s.3 mentioned in the choice of uh, in the choice of control volume as it is the choice of control volume is quite far from the walls see this control volumes are quite far from the walls this helps us to essentially ignore or disregard the shear forces that acts on the fluid because of the walls along which it travels on the wall, walls along with, along with, on which it strikes, okay, in this case the jet is striking the wall and then after striking it moves along the wall, so there will be a, <coughs> there is a shear stress that acts on the fluid, right, but since we have not, uh, the, the control, choice of control volume does not uh, allow the existence of this shear stress to come into picture, so we are cleverly able to ignore the Shear, uh, shear stress or shear force that acts on the fluid okay but like say we if we would have chosen a control volume of this form okay let me just draw it then then again i guess you can delete it so sorry let me use uh, green but if we would have chosen a control volume of this form okay, this would have been our control volume so here <coughs> what you see is that in this region okay in this region uh, specifically in this region so this region along with the uh, momentum fluxes along at the out inlets and the outlets momentum along with the momentum fluxes along the inlets and the outlet we uh, we also need to consider the shear force that would act along the along this portion of the control volume and then again again then dissociate it into the x and y direction so this so the choice of such control volume what it does is it complicates the problem because it again now forces us to consider the shear stresses as well then we need to know the velocity profile in this region so that velocity profile in this region so that we can evaluate the velocity gradients and then again evaluate the shear stresses again assuming that the fluid is newtonian okay so if it is water then explicitly mentioned as water then it is newtonian but if it's different fluid then again it comes with along with its own <coughs> complications in the constituent relationship okay so here uh, this example like, clearly shows how the choice of a clever uh, so how a clever choice of control volume <coughs> helps us in uh, mitigating the uh, problems that could arise if uh, that could arise because of uh, the calculation of additional forces that may act on the control volume okay so yeah i guess it was clear so again uh I would say that it's a very clever uh, approach or way like if you have any doubts like you can please uh, ask in the discussion forum 
uh, we as well as the TS as well as the as well as, as well as well as our course instructor Professor Gupta would look into the uh, forum and clear your doubts. So you can very well take the help of the discussion forum. So just use that if you have any doubt. Okay. So let's uh, go to the next example. So again, uh, this is an example of a moving control volume. Okay. So here, uh, this essentially uh, clears the concept regarding the relative velocity. Right? We were discussing that the term in the bracket that vr dot n cap term, uh, where vr is the relative velocity of the fluid with respect to the control volume. Right. So uh, what it uh, so an an example where the control volume is moving like it will give us a clear picture of how the uh, vr dot n come vr dot n cap term comes into picture uh, how the concept uh, or, or i must say how the concept of relative velocity comes into picture while discussing or while uh, uh, con uh, considering or dealing with the uh, momentum conservation in, in case of in case of free flow okay so let us go through the problem so this is again a curved vein so here again sim simply what I, I can draw with a jet so here the liquid comes through this inlet slides past the curved vein and then exits at a 60 degree angle uh, from the exit that is shown here at point 2 okay point two. so point 1 denotes the inlet point 2 denotes the outlet and again it is uh, attached to a surface so that the vein does not move away but the key part to note here is that the surface on which this vein is attached now is itself moving okay <coughs> so uh, let's, uh, let's just uh, look into the what we, that is the, what the explanation of the problem so to make the flow steady, we attach a frame of reference. Uh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. So here, uh, if we would have chosen a stationary control volume, right? If, if the our frame of reference was stationary in, as, as, a, as a fixed frame of reference, what would have happened is that the control volume would have been even if the flow was velocity was steady steady at 30 meter per second the control volume itself would have been moving like uh, uh, itself would have been changing with respect to time so that would have essentially made our problem unsteady right so in order to i i'm, I'm not saying that uh, we are not, we, we cannot evaluate the uh, we cannot evaluate the <coughs> Uh, pro this problem by having a stationary control volume yes we can absolutely do that but what happens is that uh, th this ha leads to the treatment of an on additional unsteady term that again can make the pro pro uh, problem a bit complicated unnecessarily complicated so an ideal way or an ideal way of dealing with such problems of problems of moving veins like if we have such problems uh, problems of moving veins must right of moving veins so what you can essentially do is just attach the control volume uh, with the vein okay or the surface at which the vein is attached so that now the problem becomes steady because the with respect to the frame of reference that you have chosen the control volume is stationary right uh, okay am i audible okay so i hope I am audible. So uh, we are now discussing in the, uh, the uh, problem of a moving vein, and love, and as a part of the week six of the fluid mechanics and application course, uh, we were dealing with uh, 
the conservation of linear momentum and angular momentum. So uh, he has joined uh, quite a bit, quite a bit late since uh, it is now 8:11. So we have discussed a considerable portion of the today's uh, part. So but never mind, you can uh, stay here for the rest of the session. So that's you are welcome for that. So. Here now uh, we are discussing a problem of moving uh, a moving control volume, like application of the uh, conserv uh, conservation linear momentum in the case of a moving control volume. So I was just uh, mentioning that if you recall the uh, linear momentum conservation in the from the RTT, you see that there is a VR dot n cap term. Right, the VR term basically tells us that the VR is the relative velocity of the fluid with respect to the control volume. Right. So uh, this example like helps us to clear that concept like how the relative velocity comes into picture, right? Because most of the problems that we were previously dealing with was a stationary control volume, so the relative velocity was equal to the absolute velocity of the incoming fluid, right? But since now the uh, re frame of reference that we have chosen is itself moving, so the considered relative velocity now comes into picture, right? So uh, and why we which has an again I have already mentioned, but just to repeat it, it makes the problem quite simple because a choice of a moving reference frame helps us to ignore the unsteady term that would have been that would have arised if we have if we would if we would have chosen a stationary control volume, right? A fixed control volume. So in order to prevent that, now we choose a reference frame that is attached to a moving vane uh, so that the unsteady term is now can be essentially cancelled, cancelled out from the governing equation. Okay, so uh, just uh, let me go uh, go to the uh, part that is written here. To make the flow steady, we attach the frame of reference to the moving vane. In this frame, the velocity of the water jet at the inlet is 20 meter per second. Why? Because see, the vane is itself moving at a velocity of 10 meter per second, right? And the incoming jet is at a velocity of 30 meter per second. So the relative velocity of the jet with respect to this moving control volume would be 30 minus 10 is equal to 20 meter per second. So <laughs> that's why the velocity of the jet is now 20 meter per second. So uh, <clears throat> and the pressure at both the port is atmospheric. So both the port essentially means that at the inlet here and the outlet here, the pressure at both this inlet and outlet is atmospheric pressure. So uh, <coughs> and, yeah, and, and, and on applying Bonnard's equation at points 1 and 2 we can conclude that the velocity at the, of the jet in the moving frame of reference remains unchanged at 20 meter per second. So uh, Bernoulli's equation can be applied like considering a very <coughs> crude assumption the, the assumption is that if we just if we disregard the shear stress if we disregard the shear stress that acts on the fluid because of its movement along this curved surface like I am not saying it won't be there because ideally it can never be zero but Considering the fact that it is almost negligible, so if we can, can consider that, and again, if we consider that this height, this elevation h is quite small, right? It's quite small. So, given these two assumptions, we can assume that we can assume a streamline from point one and point two, that's as from the inlet and the outlet, we can consider a streamline. So essentially applying the Bonner's equation tells us that the velocity at the inlet and at the outlet would be the same okay let me just write it so p1 by rho g plus v1 square by 2g plus z1 equal to p2 by rho g plus v2 square by 2g plus z2 so, so i'm saying that z1 minus z2 is almost equal to zero elevation is quite low if we take that assumption and p1 equal to p2 equal to p atmospheric and also that uh, viscous forces are negligible because uh, we cannot apply Bernoulli's equation in a viscous flow so and if we apply as an extension we need to use some head loss terms but just considering that we are disregarding the viscous forces like they are negligibly small viscous forces So we get that. So essentially, this would go out. This is gone out. 
it will essentially give us V1 V1 equal to V2 right so this is what they are mentioning so uh, since V1 equal to V2 so and M dot can be written as rho VA so uh, since area of the jet is again uh, same at both the inlet and the exit density remains constant so and also since velocity, remain co velocity remains constant so we can ideally take m dot is equal to rho v here right so rho 1 v1 v1 equal to rho 2 v2 a2 is equal to m dot here a1 equal to a2 and v1 equal to v2 right so uh, we can take that so the net uh, force along the x direction would be again can be given by uh, evaluating the net momentum fluxes at the so let me zoom out a bit at the outlet outlet and at the inlet so since the choice of reference frame makes the problem steady so the dou by dou t term is cancelled out so only the net momentum efflux uh, to all the force is equal to the uh, net force along the x direction right so yeah so this term m dot v2 cos theta basically gives us this one if we dissociate the velocity components along the x and the y direction so this will give us v cos theta cos 60 degree and this will give us v sin 60 degree right so along the x direction we would just have uh, net momentum flux at the exit m v2 cos 60 degree minus m dot v1 right so if we consider that so we get that fx is equal to minus 141 newton again the minus sign essentially gives us the idea that this fx uh, de denotes the this fx denotes the net force that acts on the control volume because of the vane right the vane that I have chosen like the this tells us that the net force that acts on the control volume is equal to minus 141 newton it's along the negative x direction right so yeah and then fy will again fy will be given by m dot v2 sin theta because at the inlet the, there is only one velocity component that is along the x direction so there is no velocity com component along the y direction so the uh, at the inlet we need not did not evaluate the moment of flux along the y direction so there is only mo the only <coughs> uh, so the moment of flux along the y direction only exists at the outlet that is at this point so we would have f y is equal to m dot v2 sin theta so that would give us 14.1 into 20 sin theta that is equal to 244.22 newton okay so i hope it was uh, quite uh, simple so uh, we will now discuss further applications of momentum equation so this part uh, i guess this was discussed in the class so this one i would take if needed so i would take it a bit uh, later so because we have a lot more to co cover in this uh, session so now uh, we discuss the pressure loss due to sudden expansion okay so uh, let let me not make this uh, session quite monotonous so okay so the student has left it seems so it's fine no issues so okay <coughs> so here uh, we discuss the pressure loss due to sudden expansion okay so uh, this sudden expansions right like comes into picture in the case of like pipe flows like if there is a sudden expansion in the <coughs> dimension of the pipes so like say if this was the <coughs> initial dimension of the pipe and just uh, because of certain sorry because of certain uh, requirement or necessity of the industry or the any home application like we need to expand the pipe uh, say to what to say? say say to decrease the velocity so that the there can be proper sedimentation or you want to decrease the velocity at the exit so we you say you suddenly increase or add essentially add an attachment like this essentially mean that you're attach, attaching an attachment to the uh, existing exit so you're attaching an uh, additional attachment that would make the area of the uh, pipe uh, or duct quite large 
so this <coughs> geometry or this scenario where sorry so this geometry or this scenario where there is a sudden increase in the dimension or the diameter of the pipe or duct so this would essentially result in pressure losses right uh, similar example we have discussed in the case of venturi meter where the, you see that uh, even if the uh, so let, let me just draw the venturi meter that will give a proper idea so let me draw it here so in the case of venturi meter like we see that the inlet uh, has a, has a the converging part of the uh, uh, venturi meter has a like quite sharp uh, decrease in the what to say quite sharp decrease in the dimension or in the diameter but at the exit they what they tend to do is they would uh, increase the length along which the diame diame diameter of the pipe increases right they have, sorry diameter of the yes the pipe increases so they, they, what it essentially does it that does that it prevents the flow separation right so since the flow is uh, would ex since the flow now will experience a uh, negative uh, adverse pressure gradient because the velocity is decreasing in this case uh, since the velocity is decreasing the pressure would increase so in this case they would the flow would experience a adverse pressure gradient okay so i guess this this will again we will discuss in the later part of this today's session so p by dx will be positive why because say if it is v d v t then v d is lesser than v t right so we will experience a uh, positive pressure gradient so positive pressure gradient it basically means an adverse pressure gradient So it will essentially mean that the flow will tend to separate, right? Because of the adverse pressure gradient. So uh, that's why, in order, uh, even if there's adverse pressure gradient, so what what we try to achieve is that we would make this increase in diameter as gradual as possible, so that there is a very so there is very so that so that there is the least pressure loss uh, from the throat to the exit, right? So there there is the least pressure loss, and pressure loss basically turns out can, can be uh, considered as energy loss. So that there is a, the, so that there is a least energy loss from the throat to the exit, right? So that's why there is a very gradual increase in the dimension or the diameter of the pipe in the case of venturi meter. Thus, so just see, like we saw that if if we would have had a similar dimension at the in, inlet, like it would have a similar dimension at, as the converging part in the case of a uh, venturi meter. We would definitely encounter some losses like there will be flow separations in these regions so there will be a considerable amount of flow or uh, energy loss because of this flow separation so but even in this case you see that there is not not there there, there isn't a sudden increase in diameter but a gradual increase in diameter but still uh, this increase is uh, a bit uh, what to say sharp the results in flow separation right the results in flow separation so you can just now imagine how much flow separation would we would be what to say imparted in the case of this geometry right because there's a sudden increase in the dimension of the pipe so the flow like directly experiences a increased uh, diameter that results in a flow separation right because there is a sudden increase in the dimension of the pipe so what, is, what would essentially happen is that the incoming flow would uh, uh, come like this and since it experiences a sudden expansion the uh, the streamlines of the flow would diverge obviously it would diverge so that the velocity of the flow is uh, decreased as we have seen in the case of steam functions the S as the streamlines or the strip diverse, the the regions where the streamlines diverse, the velocity of the flow decreases in those regions, right? So the streamlines will diverse, 
that's for sure but since there is a sudden expansion the flow would entail some recirculation regions right the flow would recirculate in these regions because the flow is separated because of the adverse pressure gradient or sudden advance uh, adverse experience of a sudden adverse pressure gradient and this will result in uh, losses energy losses or pressure losses as we mentioned so this is what we term uh, we, we term as uh, pressure losses <coughs> pressure losses or energy losses in the case of sudden expansion okay this is sudden expansion sudden expansion okay. so uh, for any uh, flow geometry or uh, flow structure uh, an ideal way to not have energy losses is to not have some such sudden expansions right if we could prevent such sudden expansions and substitute it with such uh, longer or gradual increase in diameters that would result in lesser flow separation and consequ consequently lesser uh, energy losses okay so uh, again uh, I guess this was discussed in uh, by Professor Gupta but I will just go through the mathematics of this part. The conceptual part, I guess, would be much would be uh, clarified by Professor Gupta. But let me just uh, tell it. Like, so uh, uh, in this case, uh, we see a sudden expansion in a duct or a pipe. So uh, an ideal choice of a control volume would be such that it disregards this sudden expansion zone okay you see that this is an ideal choice of our control uh, volume or control surface which essentially disregards this sudden expansion zones because if we would have considered a uh, sudden expansion uh, if we would have considered a control surface right after a sudden expansion there would be since the flow is recirculating here and there is a sudden expansion there would certainly be a force that would act in these regions okay that would act on the control surface uh, in these regions because there is sudden pressure loss right and this is if there is sudden pressure sudden pressure loss there will again be a force that would act in this control so in these regions okay so again uh, how much is the pressure loss uh, uh, and like again if we need to uh, this uh, and how can that be evaluated again then again that becomes a bit complicated so in order to prevent that or in order to <coughs> uh, essentially uh, cleverly neglect these uh, complicated calculations we can take control volume of this form that <coughs> that uh, neglects or disregards these sudden expansion regions and <coughs> is chosen in this form okay so at the inlet the net momentum influx uh, momentum influx at the region A <coughs> would be rho V1 A1 dot V1 because even if we have considered control volume of this form the net momentum influx is just because of the fluid that is confined in this region right so net momentum influx at this inlet would be rho V1 A1 V1 okay again the net influx of momentum at point B would be rho A2 V2 V2 Okay, sign conventions. I guess this will come into picture in the in the governing equation. So the external forces acting on the control volume are the pressure forces P one A two because uh, here uh, if, let me just write it. So this is A one. This is A two. So. Sorry. So, the pressure forces in the inlet would be uh, P one A two and P two A two at section B B. Okay, this section. So, substituting these terms in the momentum equation would give us P one A two minus P two A two. This is the force uh, effect that force along the x direction 
is equal to row 2 a to b2 row uh, or I said I, uh, you can just tell us row v2 square a2 minus row v1 square v1 okay minus sign y because it's quite simple again the area vector and the uh, velocity, velocity vector are in, the, are in the opposite direction so just we have a negative sign okay so again from uh, mass conservation we would get that v2 is equal to a1 a2 by v1 okay? <coughs> for incompressible flow the mass conservation gives us v2 is equal to a1 a2 by v1 right <coughs> so uh, substituting the value of v2 in this equation we can get that p2 minus p1 is equal to uh, by rho v1 square is equal to a1 by a2 minus a1 by a2 okay so if we just take uh, like this so p2 minus p1 will be equal to rho v1 square a1 a2 1 minus a1 a2 so this expression essentially gives us the net pressure loss because of the sudden expansion and here we can clearly see if uh, uh, this Uh, if this term uh, if a2 increases if this a2 increases or the ratio between a1 and a2 is higher say if a1 and a2 is higher uh, here is uh, okay I am sorry again uh, it's quite difficult to say because again if <coughs> this term increases then this will go down but this will go up so but again if this goes uh if a1 a2 okay i guess i'm sorry again i guess it's a bit a bit difficult to tell a general conclusion but still uh conceptually if you, mathematically if you, if you just wanted to know then the net pressure loss from point p1 to p2 will be given by this expression I'm sorry, uh, I guess uh, I'll just look back into it of what this expression uh, essentially tells us and, or I, I might have, okay, let me just try to uh, evaluate it myself, maybe I will just get an idea if I have done some uh, mistake in the derivations, so I write P1 minus P2. So, uh, I guess uh, expression wise there isn't any mistake. So, I guess I'll take P2 minus P1, rho P1 square P2 square P2 square
okay so uh, just for the sake of saving time i guess uh, i will let i will just uh, skip the <coughs> physical implication of this equation so uh, i will try to uh, uh, check it in the next session so uh, let if this ratio decreases like right? yeah, a2 basically it means that if a2 is much much higher than a1 so what would happen is that uh, if we just look into this equation so if a2 is higher then this term is very low then this term would be this term will again be very low so let's say it is 1 so p2 minus p1 uh, would be sorry uh, This is again uh, this part again I'm confused. So yeah, this term is positive, right? So yes, 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 yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Now I guess I'm getting a bit. So if this is small. Uh, this term is very small. It just goes down, and this is essentially so. Yes. Okay. So I uh, guess this is <coughs> how you can get an idea. So if this is uh, quite uh, small, okay, this is quite small. This basically means that a two is much much higher than a one. So uh, you will see that if this is quite small, it basically tells that uh, this would uh, be equal to one. So it will just be it will just be this ratio a one by a two, right? So whatever it is, uh, if it is positive, it basically means that pressure at at the exit increases so that basically means the pressure increase basically tells us that there is a pressure loss right the energy there is an energy loss since the velocity is increase uh, 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 decreasing the pressure would increase right? that, that basically implies a pressure loss right now if this ratio is almost equivalent right it's almost equivalent if, if it is almost equivalent to one so whatever there is this ratio, whatever the value of this ratio may be one minus this value the term essentially gives uh, a very small term right it gives a very small term so this would make this value quite smaller again and that would essentially mean that the pressure at the exit is almost uh, equal to pressure at the inlet or the, there is a very or you can say that there is a very slight increase in the value of the pressure right because of the sudden expansion so i guess this is what ideally the equation tried to mean so i'm sorry i took a bit uh, longer uh, to get a general uh, explanation of this equation but I hope I was able to clear it so again <coughs> okay so uh, again we look into the momentum, momentum correction factor so it, again the conceptual part or the basic uh, part I guess uh, you can just uh, revisit the lectures of Professor Gupta but mm -hmm. just to tell you the mathematical aspect of it so the momentum correction factor is denoted a beta <coughs> so it tells us that it is the ratio of the actual momentum flux to the momentum flux that would have uh, that would have been there if uh, if there is <coughs> if there is the same uh, if the momentum flux for the same uh, momentum flux when same mass across crosses at V average okay so this is the ratio uh, this is the uh, uh, definition of the momentum flux so actual momentum flux by the momentum flux when the same mass crosses at V average ok so uh, for a circular pipe uh, uh, like if you consider, consider a circular pipe then uh, dA is equal to 2 pi r dr so and uh, rho pi is constant then this will give us 2 pi rho 0 to r r v square b r and v average square <coughs> rho v average square a because rho pi r square v average square so if uh, we know the expression for average velocity in the case of a pipe flow uh, then we can just uh, <coughs> we can just evaluate the uh, 
like if you know the expression for v in the case of pi probe, you can just substitute the expression for uh, v in this expression and then find out the, uh, the, uh, the value of uh, v. Then it tells us that for uh, laminar probe, beta is equal to uh, 1.33 and for turbulent probe, uh, or again uh, for turbulent probe uh, with uh, 1 by 7 power low, right, beta comes out to be 1.02. Okay, so yeah. Uh, this is uh, this is not to be confused with the concept of average uh, velocity uh, because again uh, there uh, here we are considering v square instead of v so this square squaring of the velocities uh, results in the uh, change in the value of this uh, v, uh, co uh, coefficient so it's 1.32 so not to be confused with it seems quite similar as uh, the case of concept of uh, average velocity but it's not the same because here now we are considering as considering momentum fluxes right so momentum fluxes will have a velocity squared terms so that's why this uh, what to say vectors comes into a picture okay so now again uh, I guess we are a bit uh, short in time so I will just skip pass through this derivation of the moment of the momentum equation or the angular momentum equation so uh, this is the uh, final form of the uh, what to say the angular momentum equation so I, I will just uh, just I request you to go through the lectures for a detailed derivation of how it was derived so you can just uh, look into it uh, and then the, uh, the derivation where h essentially denotes uh, which is shown here h is equal to so h is equal to r cos b and capital H equal to r m ok so this is the general form of the angular momentum equation so ok uh, so just for the sake of saving time i guess uh, we will uh, since we are already uh, we, will, we will be discussing an example that has a launch sprinkler so uh, the concept of uh, what to say application of the conservation of angular momentum or the moment of momentum equation uh, <coughs> in the case of a launch sprinkler uh, could be seen in the numerical problem that we will be discussing so i guess uh, that would be better uh, approach to save time so okay. so meanwhile again we deal with the differential form of the momentum equations so again the derivation how this final form comes into picture from the integral form so that part i suggest that you look into the lecture by professor gupta so that would be a very an ideal source of knowledge or idea of the proper derivation and the proper uh, assumptions that are taken for the derivation of this form of the differential form of the momentum equation so i will suggest that so uh, there it is mentioned that this form of the this vectorial form of the linear momentum equation for a newtonian fluid is known as a navier stokes equation okay again uh, this equation i must say is the cornerstone or the in, in simple words the fundamental governing equation for all the all the fluid flow that we see or that, that we generally see in our day to day life okay like again this equation is all again only valid for newtonian fluids right but still since newtonian fluids com uh, comprises of most uh, like most of our day to day life uh, fluids that we deal in our day to day life so the applicability or the generality of the Navier's equation is very vast and just and thus has a very large area of applications and that's why i am saying this is one of the cornerstones or the fundamental building blocks of fluid mechanics <coughs> and <coughs> just uh, that it for and just as that for in the case of a in viscid fluid as an ideal case assumptions like if we just disregard the uh, viscous uh, viscosity terms so we will end up with this form of the equation which is known as the Euler's equation again this form of equation is quite uh, applicable or quite useful 
in the case of compressible flows where the effects of viscosity are not zero but can be considered to be quite negligible right so the Euler's formula equation becomes quite applicable or highly applicable in the case of compressible flows high speed flows okay uh, then here again the for system of equations for incompressible flow like we are dealing with the rho is constant is constant so we would have uh, these two sets of equations that will govern the uh, fluid flow problems uh, because this is a vectorial form that, that, that that's why it has four equations and four unknowns what are the four unknowns uh, four unknowns would be u v w and p rho is constant so there's no uh, there's not an unknown and again four equations are the x y and z momentum equations and the continuity equation so since there are four equations and four unknowns with appropriate boundary conditions this equation seems to be very well posed right it seems to be very well posed and like since because there's four equations and four unknowns and four unknowns it seems that it's quite easily solvable but this equation i guess uh, just if you just anyway if you don't know is one of the toughest equations in the uh, equation in mathematics or in the whole of sciences that has still not been solved yet so still not been solved yet in the sense that the entire equation the whole of the uh, neighbors of equation for a 3d flow uh, the uh, analytical uh, uh, equation uh, analytical solution for neighbors of equation along with the non-linear terms for a 3d flow has not been solved yet and it's one of the million dollar <coughs> problems from the clay mathematical institute so that's uh, that is uh, like that is how like that is how much this problem is like uh, difficult as well as uh, interesting I must say like difficult in the sense that the non-linearity of the non-linear basically these are non-linear terms these are non-linear terms so non-linear non-linear nature of the equation makes it quite difficult to solve and thus it is unsolvable yet so it has not been solved yet but again uh, there can be certain uh, simplifications to the governing equation that allows us to disregard or uh, cleverly remove these non-linearities that again helps us to solve this uh, solve these equations that are again exact solutions why because we are uh, giving proper assumptions that helps us to remove this uh, non-linearity and thus and thus helps us in solving these equations right but again this uh, the unsolvability arises just uh, solely uh, like essentially arises because of this non-linear nature of the term and the million dollar prize by the clay mathematical institute is ideally because ideally for solving this entire equation sorry, this entire set of equation with proper boundary conditions uh, and that the, and that solution should be analytic that analytical solution closed form solutions okay not the numerical solution numerical solutions can be obtained by using different uh, solvers or uh, commercial softwares but that's not what they want they want an analytical solution closed form analytical solutions for this entire uh, full form full neighbors of the equation okay so just to give an idea or the taste of what actual uh, what are what are the <coughs> what what are the problems that what kind of problems that uh, fluid dynamicist deal so just to give an idea I explained about the neighbor stock so just keep that in mind but we will see in the later uh, stages of this uh, today's session that how sim how we simplify the governing equation by applying certain assumptions that helps us in getting exact solution of the neighbor source equation okay so there are uh, some boundary conditions again uh, these are the boundary conditions that are mentioned so i guess i will not go too deeply this uh, there is the no 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 penetration boundary condition it's along the surface the uh, for a 
impenetrable surface, the, there is no velocity component, no normal velocity component across the surface. Okay. So here, uh, if v dot n k would be zero. Okay. So, as I mentioned, so no again there is no slip boundary condition. So the, the relative tendency and velocity at the solid surface is zero. Okay. So again there are certain uh, regions or certain assumptions that helps us to so solidify or what to say support the existence of no slip boundary condition because these are not universal there are certain cases where no slip boundary condition fail to exist okay so this is what uh, we need to keep in mind then again the continuity in the stress so uh, at an interface of the two fluids the shear stress do not experience a sudden jump in their values okay so there is a continuity in the shear distribution even at the interface of two fluids say air and water so there is a continuity in the value at the interface so, right. so uh, <coughs> now as I, as I was discussing uh, previously so there are some sort important uh, simplifications in the case of Navier's stress equation so for the case of steady flows this term goes out again uh, for the case of one dimensional fully developed flows uh, the non-linear terms uh, get cancelled out we will see when we look into the examples of a pipe flow or coit flow problems the, how this non-linear term cancels out and then we are just left with uh, this portion of the equation so this again since these are linear this is again, these are quite easily second order linear since if this side is zero right if the right, left hand side is zero then we are just essentially left with a second order uh, linear homogeneous linear equation so these are again quite easily uh, quite solvable and not, not so very easily solvable right? different boundary conditions and uh, functional form of the equations of uh, the parameters may make it quite difficult but uh, it is this at least the homogeneous linear homogeneous second order part is quite again uh, much more much more simpler compared to the entire neighbor story equation that has the non steady term unsteady term as well as the non linear term okay so that's it so as I was previously mentioning, for a fully developed flow, the, in the case of a flow, to, flow in a channel, there is no change in the flow direction and only one component of velocity exists. Okay, so that is in the case of uh, fully developed flow in a circular pipe, which is also known as the Hagen Poiseuille flow. The uh, governing equation along the uh, z direction becomes. Uh, Z direction basically it means that since we are dealing with a pipe flow, the geometry uh, tells us that an ideal choice of coordinate system would be the cylindrical coordinate system. So there would be a, uh, R component of the governing equation, theta component of the governing equation, and the Z component of the governing equation. So here I just mentioned the Z component of the governing equation. So uh, applying the assumption that the flow is fully developed, so it basically means that the velocity won't. Okay, let me just draw it. That will make much sense. So this is the confinement or the pipe through which the velocity uh, was developing. So these are the uh, boundary layers. So again, I didn't want to go into it because the concept of boundary layers is again important. But I hope uh, we will uh, we will get to know once we uh, reach the boundary layer portion of the course. So essentially, uh, what the full developer means is that the So in this region, the developing region, the z component of velocity, or u z, I must say, or the uh, yes, the z component of the velocity u z is uh, uh, a function of both r and z. But in the fully developed region, like when the boundary layers uh, merge together and the flow is fully developed, the fully developed region. Here, u is sorry, u z is only a function of r. Okay. So velocity profile it varies along the radial direction, but it remains constant 
along the z direction so along the axial direction uh, the velocity co velocity profile won't change okay so it will only depend the it will only vary along the radial direction so that can be seen here okay so given this uh, assumption that only we are only solving that if you are only solving for a fully developed flow or flow in a fully developed region that again simplifies the navier sort equation that essentially you will see like if you are solving from scratch the if you are writing the gaurian equation from scratch and solving and cancelling out the unwanted terms you can see that this ideal this assumption or this clever assumption of fully developed flow helps us in ignoring or disregarding the nonlinearities that may have arisen if the flow was not fully developed so for fully developed flow all the nonlinear terms in the Uh, left hand side of the navier sort equations are essentially uh, cancelled out and we are just left with a second order homogeneous uh, gaurian equation that can be easily solved compared to a non linear equation okay. and for this kind of equations we have exact solutions so uh, i guess we have mentioned it in the data part of the slide but again since we are quite uh, limited uh, we have Uh, quite limited in time, so I guess to skip past many of the concepts. So a bit fast here. So uh, here uh, this another example of a uh, exact solution of the navier sort equation. So here we deal with uh, a play poisier poisier coiled flow or simply a coiled flow in a two D channel. So a poisier coiled flow essentially means that this kind of coiled flows are now driven by pressure. There is a pressure gradient that exists along the axial direction. Okay. so in this case the uh, gaurian equations i guess <coughs> i just see how it cancels out so from the uh, navier sort equation uh, this is the continuity equation not to confuse with so this is the continuity equation so from the continuity equation we get that do u by do x plus do u by do y equals 0 and v is 0 v is essentially 0 because uh, uh <coughs> from here like if we as you have uh, uh here <coughs> so here since the v component of velocity is zero because it's only one uh, yeah, i'm sorry since there is only one velocity component that is being generated because of the movement of the upper plate so uh the v component of velocity is equal to zero so here u is only a function of y okay u is function of y only do you would say also it is means that it essentially means that u is a function of y only because since we are dealing in only 2d case like it is it can be 3d case but the gradients in the z direction can be uh, considered to be negligible because we consider that the dimensions or the dimensions along the uh, z coordinate is much much greater than the dimensions along the x or the y coordinates okay uh, along the y coordinates so gradients along the y direction can be essentially neglected so we get that u is a function of y only okay so it from that assumption we get that <coughs> for steady state again uh, this term sorry this term goes to zero do you do x zero from the continuity equation this equation and v is zero that is from the inherent assumption that flow is 1d okay so again uh, see you can clearly see it how the uh, choice or the assumption one d flow assumption uh, helps in cancelling out the non linear terms so these terms are easily cancel out but uh, so finally after this uh, terms are cancelled out we get a uh, velocity profile of this form where uh, in our geometry uh, where the choice of our origin is at the center line of the channel of the channel where the upper plate is at a location of y equal to positive b and then Lower plate is at a location of y equal to negative b. Okay, this is the choice for our geometry, and the upper plate is moving at the velocity of v naught. So after uh, solving this Gaurian equation, the second order Gaurian equation, so we get the velocity profile of this form. So which is since and also since there is a pressure gradient, so let me just denote it. So there is also a pressure gradient along the positive x direction. So this 
is a what to say essentially a pressure driven as well as the shear driven flow where the uh, the pressure gradient drives the flow along with it the the moment of the upper plate <coughs> the moment of this upper plate also drives the flow or you can say generates or creates the flow so uh, that's why uh, since again you will see that since the governing equations for both these types of are linear and are devoid of the non-linear terms that can complicate the equations we can since the equations are linear linear equations then we can superpose the solutions right so we can apply the superposition principle Then apply the proposition principle and uh, the net result of the velocity profiles can be uh, is actually the sum of these two different uh, governing equations okay this this the uh, linear part I'm sorry I have to skip fast so fast because of uh, skip fast so fast because of the time constraint but the first part this linear part this linear velocity profile is because of the simple coet flow. Let me just write it. It will be quite helpful. So, this is because of the simple coet flow. This is shear driven. And this parabolic profile is poison wave flow. Special view. Okay, so uh, this is what uh, I wanted to tell. So <coughs> let me just again, I guess, uh, we'll discuss this example if time permits. But uh, now, more importantly, I guess we need to discuss the long sprinkler part uh, example. So let me just take the long sprinkler example part okay so uh, let's go through this example uh, okay Cons uh, the long sprinkler has two jets of water of diameter 5 millimeter the diameter of the jets are given as 5 millimeter issuing at water at 3 meter per second at 60 degree to the tangent okay so if it is a tangent of the circle that if you draw around the circumference of this uh, long sprinkler so if you draw a tangent so with respect to this tangent the velocity with which the water comes out velocity of jet with which the water comes out is 60 degree okay as mentioned here and i guess zoom in a bit okay. the arms of the sprinkler rotate because of the jet reaction okay so this is one of the key uh, working principles of the water sprinkler that we see in our gardens so we are asked to find the steady state angular velocity omega <coughs> if the pivot is assumed to be frictionless. So what they are saying that uh, this sprinkler is uh, being attached to a uh, pivot. So the friction between the pivot and this rotating uh, part of the sprinkler is considered to be negligible. Okay. Assume that water enters the sprinkler actually through the central pipe. So it is, uh, it is asked to assume that. Uh, if this is the uh, this is the axis along which the let me just draw it so this is the axis along which the our sprinkler lies so this is one part this is the, part. So this is the z direction if i may say so this they told that the water enters this sprinkler axially okay nor in a normal direction it, along, it, acts along, it, it, uh, it enters the sprinkler in the, along the z direction okay. so, so since again since the geomet you can clearly see the geometry uh, tells us that the ideal choice of the coordinate system would be the cylindrical coordinate system so we will be dealing with r and theta okay so these are the this is the coordinate system that we will be dealing with in our case. So, sorry again. Okay. So, uh, this is the geometry we have. The, the uh, diameter of the sprinkler is given as 1 meter. 
and it's rotating with a angular velocity omega so we are asked to find the value of this omega okay so let me just it's a quite conceptual problem so let me just go through all the assumptions or uh, steps that we need to consider so that it, it becomes quite distinctly clear and so, and so that you can, you can deal with such problems uh, in, the, uh, in the later part of the course as well right the application of angular momentum is <coughs> a bit i won't say tricky but conceptual highly conceptual so let let's just uh, go to the uh, step by step uh, implementation of the angular momentum equation that is a non-spinner okay so yes uh, <coughs> okay so here uh, here we take a stationary control volume again there are some key terms a stationary control volume so the control volume that is being chosen here is stationary and not moving okay in previous case we saw that the, the in the case of a moving vane the control volume that was that we chose was moving with the uh, vane okay the moving with the vane with its velocity right uh, but here in the case we choose a control volume that is stationary but it encloses the diameter or the encloses the both the exits of the sprinter okay so it is told that uh, just excuse me for a minute oh. just excuse me for a minute I'll, I'll be back so just excuse me for a minute So <coughs> I'm again sorry for uh, the delay. So, uh, okay, I'm sorry. So let's continue. So <coughs> here we take a stationary control volume enclosing the entire region swept by the arms. Okay, these are the arms of the sprinter. So we with the control volume that we take is a stationary control volume that encloses the entire region and uh, swept by the arm of the sprinkler okay as the arms rotate the water issues in the different directions at different times so the linear momentum flux changes with time okay this is a very key uh, assumption or not assumption a key fact to note okay like force like while dealing with a, a water sprinkler like you may one may ask like why we are not uh, why we are not what to say solving or approaching the problem of a water sprinkler from the linear momentum conservation perspective right there also the linear momentum must be conserved because it's a physical system so it will be conserved right the net change of rate of change of linear momentum would be equal to net force applied in the water sprinkler but why we are not approaching this problem in that perspective so the key thing to note is that since when since the arms are rotating the water that would be issued in different directions at different times and so the linear momentum flux will change with time with, will change with time okay so here now we will be dealing with a unsteady uh, linear momentum equation that would again complicate the problem because as, uh, uh, as far as the general form of integral form of the governing equation goes the uns uh, it is the actually the unsteady part that creates the main issue right that is uh, that because now if we are dealing unsteady unsteady uh, term we need to know the variation of the parameters within the uh, integral sign that is the velocity and the they say density the velocity and the, in this case the and the control volume as well so since uh, the unsteady term would uh, unsteady term would require us to know the variation of the velocity density and the control volume respect to time so that would, I would not say make the comp problem unsolvable, but it will create a much an additional difficulty that uh, makes the problem quite uh, difficult to be approached. Okay, so that's why this is one of the main reasons we are not dealing with approaching this problem in the in the perspective of linear momentum conservation. Okay.
but so now we see that but the flux of the moment of momentum has a constant direction that is along the axis of rotation okay and has a constant magnitude see because <coughs> what is the uh, flux of uh, what is the uh, moment of the momentary rotation that basically means it is equal to r cross mv this is h and since this is a cross product it will basically mean that since the velocity and the uh, uh, this radial distance lie on the r theta plane so the direction of this uh, moment of the momentum equation would be along the z direction right so direction of the moment of the momentum equation will remain constant that is along the z direction <coughs> and also that's why it is convenient that's why it is convenient to work with the z component of the moment of the momentum equation rather than with the momentum equation okay so this is a very key uh, reason why we are dealing with uh, the angular momentum equation or the moment of the momentum equation instead of the momentum equation itself okay so right again uh, we look a bit further so <coughs> although the flow within the control volume is unsteady okay the total moment of Okay, I have repeated. I might have repeated this uh, uh, term moment. So the total moment of the momentum within the control volume is constant. Okay, is constant with with time. Okay, this is because r cross v for any segment of the sprinkler arm is independent of the angular position of the arms. Okay, and since uh, it's very important. Okay, why this is constant? Uh, because see r cross v this this product for any segment of the sprinkler arms is independent of the angular position of the arms okay so this this entity would remain independent of the angular uh, position of the arms that and for any segment any particular segment it's any particular radial distance from the center of the sprinkler okay so this will remain constant and thus the rate of accumulation of the moment of momentum is zero so the since this is constant so we thus we can essentially uh, ignore or neglect the uh, unsteady part of the angular momentum equation okay not the linear momentum equation but the angular momentum equation so we can ideally neglect the unsteady part of the angular momentum equation and thus the rate of accumulation of the moment of the momentum is zero and since the external torque in the z direction is also zero it is zero why because we, from the start itself we have assumed that the force that uh, the, 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 the friction between the pivot and the uh, portion that attaches the portion of the spring that is attached on the pivot is uh, negligible or zero so that's why they, they, it won't have any external Torque, basically the reaction torque that acts on the uh, sprinkler the, uh, the, the, on, the, uh, on our control volume that is, our, that is our control volume so there will there won't be any external torque that would act on the control volume again this is an ideal case assumption so ideally because there is uh, there would be a friction so there would, there would be an external torque that would act on the body but in this case to simplify our analysis we assume that there is no external torque that acts on the control volume okay so uh, so thus we would have uh, Tz, that is torque along the z direction would be 0 and then we will equal to the net uh, angular momentum efflux. So it, so it essentially tells us that since this is 0, this is 0, so the net momentum efflux, uh, sorry, the net angular momentum efflux in the along, uh, uh, across the exits of the sprinkler would be zero okay so uh, so we have okay again this is this is just uh, quite elementary the velocity here is measured in terms of the reference frame fixed with the stationary control circuit volume okay so yes so this is because we have from start itself we have assumed the stationary control volume okay so we go through it 
the water crosses the control surface at, at the two jet orifices, okay, at A and B. So A and B, just if you go to it, the water crosses the uh, uh, jet at these two points, okay. Control, uh, crosses the control surface. And <coughs> the center is at C, okay. At C, there is no contribution to the momentum, momentum, momentum flux since B is normal to the normal to R because uh, at the inlet we assume that the water entered axially at the uh, at this region at the center and because uh, uh, the, uh, the because the water enters axially in this region so the net contribution net contribution of it uh, net its net contribution would be zero because this term would be zero because r would be equal to zero so so this would essentially give the moment of the momentum equation would be zero so that would be zero and okay and uh, and thus the net efflux of momentum as, as just that is just the conclusion that we get from this equation the net efflux of momentum at the two z orifices is zero okay this is this statement is just what this equation means okay, okay. the jet velocity of 3 meter per second jet 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 jet, jet <coughs> sorry i'm sorry the jet velocity of 3 meter per second is with respect to the jet orifice okay of course uh, we have chosen our control surface to be control uh, surface which uh, stationary so velocity uh, at which the this liquid jet comes out of the uh, exits or the exits of the sprinklers it is 3 meter per second okay and since the jet orifice is itself moving the two velocities should be added vectorially to obtain the velocity with respect to the control surface okay see uh, the thing is that the velocity that is being mentioned here that's given here it is a jet velocity okay the velocity with which let me just go back to the diagram so 3 meter per second is actually the jet velocity so it is a velocity with which this jet comes out of the exit of this uh, sprinklers with, with respect to a con uh, with respect to a stationary control surface okay but again since we know that these jets are rotating with a uh, constant uh, angular momentum sorry angular velocity so these jets jet are itself moving okay so these jets will itself have a uh, radial uh, radial comp uh, radial as well as axial so would have itself have a radial uh, would itself have one some some velocity so in in order to get the velocity the what to say the net velocity with uh, the with which the jet exits or the liquid jet exits this uh, control surface would actually be the sub vector sum of the velocity of the liquid jet with respect to the uh, stationary uh, with respect to the stationary frame of reference not the control surface but the stationary frame of reference as well as the velocity of the sprinklers the angular velocity of the sprinkler that with which the sprinklers rotate okay so we need to do the vector sum of these both velocities which would in turn give us the net velocity with with, with which uh, the liquid uh, the liquid jet comes out of the control surface okay not the jet but the control surface that we have chosen okay and this would have been identical if we would have chosen a control surface that rotates along with the sprinklers but we have not chosen something like that we have chosen a control surface that is stationary right so we need to get the absolute velocity of the jet with respect to our stationary control surface okay so i will just suggest that you go back again and again with the lecture notes or see the problems just not to get confused with what is the control surface what is the stationary frame of reference what is the exit of the jet and how they are different because of the chosen frame of reference so this is what i guess the very crux of the problem so that need to be that you need to be very clear about so 
I hope and that will come come to regular practice. So that's fine. So okay. So uh, yes. So the tangential component, the tangential component of velocity v ten of the absolute velocity v absolute is given by v ten is equal to v j cos theta minus omega r. So that will be, that will be equal to three cos sixty degree minus zero point five omega because r is zero point five meters. So three is a velocity component, uh, velocity uh, com velocity of the jet. So it will be three cos sixty degree minus zero point five omega. Okay. And the radial component of the uh, this absolute velocity would be v j sin theta. Okay. Uh, this can be uh, understood by this velocity uh, this velocity triangle. So if v j is the angular uh, red, uh, the velocity of the with respect to which the jet comes out of the sprinkler this is the velocity and v o o omega r is the velocity with which this sprinkler rotates so the net velocity would be the uh, vector sum of these two velocity components that would basically be the parallelogram law right so this will basically give us the uh, the net resultant velocity because of this liquid jet Vj and the angular velocity of the sprinklers. Okay, so uh, we need to do the vector sum of these two uh, velocity components. But again, only the tangential component of veloc absolute velocity contributes to the moment of the momentum in the z direction. Okay, and it is only the tangential component of this velocity, this absolute velocity. Sorry, this is the only tangential component that would result in the moment, right? Because we know that in while evaluating the torque or say the torque, we uh, take the tangential uh, component of the force. That is, the, the tangential force that acts along the uh, surface, right? Uh, body, like say, if uh, you want to find the net uh, torque or moment, this is again a core mechanical concept. What is the difference between torque and moment? But just say right now. So, if you are trying to find a net torque, let me just make it quite uh, more simpler. So, if you are considering a cylindrical rod, right, then we are applying, and this is a it is center, and we are applying a shear force along its circumference. So, the net torque would be equal to the this uh, tangential force. And the perpendicular distance, right? Even if there's agile force, this won't this won't uh, come into picture for the evaluation of net torque. It's only the tangential force that comes into picture for the evaluation of the torque, right? So it is the tangential force cross R. Or to be more accurate, R cross F T. Similar to that, it is only this tangential component of velocity that would actually contribute to the net uh, angular momentum of this water sprinkler right and thus this is what we need to consider while evaluating the net flux through the uh, sprinkler right through, the, through our control surface not the sprinkler through our control surface so thus we get 2 into half of this 3 cos 60 degree minus 0 0.5 omega into uh, rho vj aj okay so 2 why uh, because both are at the exits so uh, uh, we need to uh, add uh, the contribution of both the exits, so it is uh, 2 and rho aj vj is the net uh, volume for it. Okay, so <coughs> so we can see that this is equal to 0, and see, uh, we can see that since these all are positive quantities, this rho vj aj, so the only term that can be equal to 0 to make this entire term equal to 0 would be this term right this term this term so to make to make it equal to zero we would have omega is equal uh, to for this to be equal to zero we need we have three co we should have three cos 60 degree minus 0 0.5 omega should be equal to zero that would essentially give us omega is equal to 0 0.5 okay so So I hope uh, <coughs> if I'm not wrong, so let me just uh, I guess some I'll just let me just evaluate it. Uh, so 3 cos 60 degree minus 0 0.5 omega is equal to 0 0.5. Uh, 
3 cos 6 degree is equal to 0 0.5 for my So I am going to do 3 into cos 6 is So I guess uh, so it will be 1.5 by 0 0.5. So this will give us omega is equal to 3 radians per second. Okay, so I guess this I have done wrong. So it will be 3 radians per second. That's why I was a bit confused. So omega will be 3 radians per second. So this is what we had to find. So this is our solution. So I guess uh, I will stop here for today. So I will share these notes. So you can just there are a lot more problems that you, that that were discussed. So you can go through the problems, get an idea, and if you have any doubt, you can uh, write in the discussion form. Okay. So I hope that's all will be for today. So uh, thank you.